This session is going to be about building skills and the future of insurance. So, um, my two guests here, I have uh, Nicholas Pacino, co-founder of Senate Insurance, and I have Nadine Collado, Director of Professional Development and Continuing Education. Round of applause, please. So for anyone that doesn't know, I'm Claire Ruel. Um, I'm technology editor at Insurance Times. Um, something that the minister is very, very passionate about is encouraging young people to become interested in financial services and insurance. Um, and when it comes to insurance, I, I think, and we've discussed this as well, um, I think the industry is kind of seen as a silent pillar. And I think more work needs to be done um, to, to kind of like shine a, a spotlight on insurance and make it more um, accessible to young people. Um, so, in this session, we're going to look at insurance as a profession, training in the sector, um, opportunity, opportunities, and how the skills gap can be addressed. Um, so, I am going to start with a poll again. So, um, I'm going to ask the audience, does insurance as a profession get enough attention in further and higher education? Um, hands up for yes. Nobody? Hands up for no? Okay. I think the whole right. The whole room. <laughs> okay, so I want to start by discussing insurance Could as... Could I just add to that? So, yes, Because there's only two university degrees in the UK that offer an insurance degree. Is that right? So I think the room was right. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, insurance as a silent pillar. Um, I'm going to give credit to Nicholas over here for uh, dubbing that term, insurance as a silent pillar. And I'm going to come to him and just ask him to explain what he means by insurance being a silent pillar. Okay, so domestically, insurance sits behind the traditional industries. So, account accountancy, law, teaching, gaming. So when young professionals think about their careers, in my view, insurance is silent. But there's no doubt about the contribution that the insurance sector gives to the local economy. So this is, this is why I call it the silent pillar. Okay. Um, Nadine, uh, sorry, can I, sorry, can I elaborate? Okay. So domestically, the insurance industry has emerged in the last 20 years. So I also think we could do more to promote the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, the industry has a lot to offer in terms of roles. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a, an introvert or an extrovert, whether you're analytical, sales-driven or mathematical, the industry has a role for you. And we're talking underwriters, claims managers, insurance management, <laughs> insurer tech. There's a diversity of roles and I think there's, there's more to do about it. So some stats, there are about 500 employees in the Gibraltar insurance industry, of which 40% are Gibraltarian and the 60% are non-Gibraltarian. So I think that sort of shows you that there is a, li a little bit more to do there. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. Um, Nadine, coming to you, um, do you agree with Nicholas? Is insurance in a, a silent pillar? Well, if you consider that, I think last year's in the budget speech, the previous Minister for Financial Services, Albert Isola, stated that seven billion in gross premium income came into uh, Gibraltar. That was the 2022 stats, I think. Okay. That yourselves and other people have mentioned 30% of the motor insurance industry in the UK, 20% per, uh, pet insurance, etc. Yep. This, unless you listen to the budget speech, mm -hmm. or you're really into insurance, that's not, no, that's not typically known by other sectors in financial services or the public at large. So in terms of a strong pillar of the economy, I agree that it is, and it's silent because it's not particularly uh, as public as other areas. Yes, yeah, spot uh, on, Nadine. I think for, for people outside of the insurance industry, mm -hmm. um, if I were to speak to, to my friends, to my colleagues, um, no one's aware of the 30% statistic, the 7 billion gross written premium. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, and I think today, for example, I'm sorry I'm butting in, but today, for example, is what we could do to change it, yeah. um, to make it more prominent, more visible out there. So for industry-specific events like today, 
um, what this topical or other workshops or whatever, this is the way of pushing it and making Absolutely. it a bit more visible. Well so. done, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, moving on. Um, I wondered if we could just talk about um, the kind of recruitment that exists in Gibraltar for financial services. So I don't know if Nadine, did you want to kick off with that one? Recruitment, crikey. I think there's recruitment issues in financial services typically. I don't think insurance is the only one. I know that we have 40%, as your stat said, mm -hmm. of, of locals doing it. Uh, but I think the other, the other sectors also suffer from the same situation, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good problem to have, but nonetheless, it's something we have to work on. Um, you may be aware, I think Catherine mentioned, that we have scholarships and most of our 18-year-olds go to the UK to study. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, those who don't want to go to the UK um, don't have, as I said, the visibility in financial services sector. I know the minister, the current minister, Angela Feetham, has a very sort of urgent drive to change that and has had like... Um, meetings in the finance center with young, uh, younger people as well. So because there's only um, two particular degrees specialized in insurance, otherwise it's professional qualifications, because that's not so visible, I think perhaps introducing, and I'm going out on a limb here, um, the level three, for example, that's an A-level equivalent the certificate of insurance, yeah. which is the first, the first one, into the College of Further Education to get, in, in relation to this industry, of course, to get 16-year-olds um, aware that this professional qualification and this industry is there for the taking, so they have some kind of qualification and going forward and taking it over there. So that could be done for all the other industries as well. Okay, Nicholas, do so you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I've got to agree that there is a recruitment challenge, and I think it was mentioned earlier today. But I think it's important to, to understand that there are recent initiatives in place which are already beginning to bridge the gap. Um, so, for instance, if you were to Google Insurance Apprenticeship Gibraltar 2020, you would come across a Gibraltar Garment article and you'd come across a very powerful image. The image is powerful because you can see Minister Vosano you can see a young group of professionals and they're all wearing COVID masks. Um, so whilst the whole world was shutting down, Gibraltar was creating insurance jobs, um, creating a platform for young people to enter the industry and at the same time helping insurance organizations during travel time. We had travel insurers struggling. So there are initiatives that have already been in place recently which are sort of paying dividend, I would say. Um, I and think it could be uh, glamorized a bit more Sorry? in terms of promote the industry as well for younger people. Yeah. Mm. Oh, we was mentioning that earlier on as well. That mm. Yeah. Um, an example of the success is from the initial code is one of the trainees who's now in a senior position within the GFSC. So we're seeing uh, a bit of development. Um, just coming back to your point on um, glamorization, um, I think... Uh, emerging technologies um, definitely attract young people to the sector. Things like AI, uh, blockchain, um, machine learning, automation. Um, but one thing I noted when I was um, putting this panel together um, was that um, Zurich actually highlighted a skills gap in automation. Um, and especially as AI is a new technology and we're still waiting to hear regulation around that. Um, I wanted to ask, um, and I'll come to Nicholas first, I wanted to ask um, how, how the industry can kind of address the ongoing need for skills enhancement because that, that was one of the problems with um, the AI skills gap. So... I can only think of the local industry and I think the skill, the skill gap can be bridged by the, help, by the help of the Gibraltar Insurance Institute, the Gibraltar mm -hmm. Insurance Association in maintaining ourselves communicated with the industry, reaching out. Um, the GII already carries out a lot of work in terms of education and training. Um, I think in this way we can bridge the, the skills gap. In Gibraltar specifically, domestically, we've got the Digital Skills Academy, which is 
designed specifically for that, and I think in a way we're already bridging that gap. Um, maybe not specifically to insurance, but in the tech in the tech area, um, the Digital Skills Academy uh, supports the GII with, uh, with with training as well. So um, I think that's one way of supporting and bridging that skill gap. Lucine, mm -hmm. do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we've heard throughout the day that the jurisdiction is is naturally nimble and fast pacing and and, and reacts very quickly. So I think, as you've mentioned, the combination of those and Another, I mean, I think somebody mentioned the blockchain element, smart contracts coming into yep. insurance as well. That's already happening. Um, so I think we, we, we're quite good as a jurisdiction to, to react. That of course, work has to be done and to be polished. I think that's... We're agile as a jurisdiction. Uh, yeah, that's parallel yeah. With, with other sectors. That AI is also having, having a bit of a... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll bring a parallel to higher education. Mm -hmm. um, the advent of ChatGPT, you all know ChatGPT, yeah? So... That affects us as a university and how we design assessments, but that's all the other thing that affects the impact of how we design the assessments. We encourage the students to use ChatGPT. We can't deny mm -hmm. that that's happening, so mm -hmm. it's just finding a way of making it, of Naturally. going round and adapting to it, and I think that works for all the other industries mm -hmm. in a different way, of course. Yeah. Um, there was one opportunity... Um, that was identified, um, and that is the appointed representative route. Um, and I was wondering if Nicholas could explain a bit more about what an appointed representative actually does and why, it's, why he thinks it's a good opportunity for young people. So the appointed representative, um, the appointed representative is a, an individual or a business that sits behind a licensed intermediary. So it's a great platform for um, someone wanting to start up in business, in insurance business, to, I guess, um, save costs, um, use the expertise of the insurance intermediary. They don't need to go through the licensing application. They need to meet a certain criteria. They would need to be monitored by the insurance intermediary. But ultimately, you can bring, bring up an idea, a business idea. Um, I guess the Zigo example is, is, is perfect. Uh, you can use the appointed representative model to, to launch your startup. And I think it's a great, it's very, it's very well utilized in the UK. I don't have statistics, but if you Google it, you'll be amazed how many appointed representatives there are in the UK. I think locally, it's underutilized. And it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity for, for young professionals and for startups in general. Okay, interesting. Um, Nadine, did you have anything to add to that? No, it's very industry specific. <laughs> okay, all right, lovely. I will move on. Um, okay, so talking about um, recruiting more young people in insurance, there is one issue um, that has been a long-standing issue in general insurance um, as well, and that is um, the issue of um, retention. So young people tend to join the industry and then leave pretty quickly. Um, so, for example, statistics from the SIGSIC advisory in March 2023 found that only 2% of insurance executives were ethnic minorities. And speaking as an ethnic minority woman myself and the situation in journalism, which also has um, a low number of ethnic minorities, um, I, think, I think it's um, really interesting and an and a issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so coming to Nicholas first, um, I was wondering... Um, if you could talk a bit about your own background and um, what, what kind of a um, mentorship is available in insurance, because I feel like this helps um, sector-wide, not just insurance. Okay, shall I answer the first bit first? Yes. Yeah. So we have about 500 employees in the local insurance industry. Mm. Um, as I mentioned earlier, about 60% are non-Gibraltarians, 40% are Gibraltarians, so... Um, I don't have any ethnic minority uh, statistics available, um, but I don't think there's a dominant issue domestically. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel we have quite a diverse workforce in Gibraltar. Um, my background, I'm Gibraltarian, um, Spanish and uh, Italian roots, Italian-Spanish roots. Um, if, if I think of uh, the board of my company where I work, 
Um, it's, I guess, fairly diverse. We're all Gibraltarians. My, one of my the directors is Portuguese. Um, very proud of our heritage. And generally, as I say, I think there's, the, um, there's not an issue with diversity. We're well represented in Jib. We don't have the stats not to, to, no, to go by. Not anyway. a lot of stats available, unfortunately. Does that sort of answer? Yeah, yeah, that does. Um, so the statistics, um, that's also interesting as well because um, there's, there's no kind of um, regula regulatory measures that says you've got to declare your ethnicity. So a lot of firms don't have these statistics to show. Is that right? I think it's right. Okay. Um, Nadine, could I come to you? Um, could you talk a bit about your background and um, just different opportunities for young people in insurance? Okay. My background, so I did 20 years in the fiduciary sector, the licensed mm -hmm. fiduciary sector locally. I was a director mm -hmm. of, of one of the yeah, fiduciary outfits in Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to higher education nine years ago. I'm founder member of the University of Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. There were six of us. And my role predominantly is professional development and continuing education, which is to make sure the domestic market is upskilled and any qualifications, um, development needs are at least seen uh, uh, as much as, uh, as we can. We have a business, with, we have key advisory groups. Um, the one in relevant to this particular sector is a business um, key advisory group. We have the CII represented, and sorry, the GII represented yep. there, but the Education Secretary always has been. We have banks, we have funds, we have DLT, we have a big, massive um, group, and they actually sort of feed into what the industry needs. Um, as a result, recently, last year, we launched a financial services diploma, um, very much sort of specialized in Gibraltar, and it has eight units, of which one is insurance, and Nick teaches in that one. Um, the other one is DLT, funds, bank, and companies, compliance. And this is a very interesting diploma because in terms of recruitment that you mentioned earlier, um, if anybody wants to put the foot in the door and to just showcase what Gibraltar is as financial services jurisdiction, it actually allows you to have, and it's, it's quite a meaningful introduction, it's quite intense actually as a course, um, but into all of these diff different areas. And last year, we had 17 last year, and fi uh, 15, sorry, 15 last year and 17 this year, and we had two people say, I think, I think one person is here today in the audience, actually. Um, um, but there's two, two persons said, had I known that I would have enjoyed funds so much, I perhaps I'd have a career in funds and not in whatever the person had. So it does give a bit of an insight. Is that job done? In what way? In that they've identified uh, a career Well, path. no, because this person had a career in another sector, but they said, you know what, I wish I'd had this opportunity before. So in terms of the, the drive of, of bringing financial sector more to the fore, and this is, we have the reason that the, we wrote this one. And it's actually, it's a very good one because it's a collaborative effort with all the industry associations. We went, we reached out to them and said, what do you need as an introduction, as a refresher? What, what skills do you need? What do you have to, technical and practical procedural skills? And also with the FSC. And it's a partnership with the FSC and they, are, they have endorsed this qualification, which is the only qualification they've endorsed ever. So in terms of that, this is what we do, or I do at least, um, in the university. And in terms of re uh, specifically to the insurance sector, it's also a success story. Um, in 2017, we were the first jurisdiction to achieve a fast track route for the certificate and the diploma in insurance. Um, the certificate is a level three, it is an A-level equivalent, and, and the diploma is a level four, the first year degree. And this means, oh, that meant, and this means still, that the time that the student, that the person who works in insurance or wants to go and work in insurance is condensed. So, for example, the certificate took 18 months, it now takes nine months, and the diploma took three years, it takes 15 to 18 months. And that was a bit of a, this was the, CI, uh, the GII, and I'm going to name Lorraine Mobley, she really pushed for this, the university, and we achieved this particular fast track version, which is now used in other jurisdictions. So that's a, that's a good success story for Gibraltar, actually. And we've had, I'll give you some Absolutely. stats, that's why I put this here. We've sure. had since uh, 2017, 34 people do the certificate and 24 do the diploma. Um, we had two years within the COVID years, so we didn't 
when they're because it's a face-to-face -face qualification. So I can go on about it because we have lots of stuff here, but it's it's beneficial to the student and the employer because mm -hmm. there's less time out of the office, there's less uh, it's less expensive, it's face-to-face -face training, which means increased chances of passing the qualification. And it, it really helps because it it accommodates work-based learning, just the, the way that the course is designed when you're especially when you're young and you you know you just start at work and you want to set these exams. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it really it really helps. Okay. Um, before I wrap up and cut to questions, um, I just wanted to ask something about higher education. So we've had examples for um, things like university, but what about older students? What about older students who maybe want to study alongside work or, you know, maybe have a child? How, how can they fit training well, in? Well, the professional qualifications, th this side, at least my side, um, are typically done in the evenings to accommodate people who work. Mm -hmm. Um, so typically six to eight o'clock in the evenings. Mm -hmm. So two times a week, twice a week or once a week, but it's done specifically to accommodate those who work or obviously you have a child, you have to have child minding arrangements done. Um, mm -hmm. But it's done with that in mind. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, could I get final thoughts from you both um, in terms of is, is there more work to do in training and development initiatives in insurance? And why, if so? So there's always more work, Nick. No, there, there, <laughs> is, there is there is more to do. Yeah. Um, I think there there are already initiatives in place which are bridging skills gap and developing talent. Um, again, I want want to mention the Gibraltar Insurance Institute, the Gibraltar Insurance Association. I think the the GII has about 420 individual members. The GIA has about 100 corporate members. And the distinction is in the firms versus individuals. Huh? Exactly. And they both support the memberships really well. And we're, we're agile. We're here to help. I think that's the message to send across. And so is the Gibraltar government. Like the example of the apprenticeship scheme during COVID, that is now in its third year running and it keeps moving on. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that Minister Fitam and Minister Santos will, will enhance it this year. Those are my final remarks. I echo them. I think uh, there's always everything is always evolving. The nature of the industry is evolving. The way that we study is evolving. So I think there's always more to be done. But I think just to wrap, to loop it back to the first question that you, you actually mentioned, I think the visibility is, is key here. It's making the insurance sector more palatable, more, more available to, to school leavers or mature. Um, Demonstrate person. that it's that it's interesting. Yeah, which is what um, I think. The keynote speaker earlier on today was mentioned. Correct. It's exciting, and I think it's been mentioned throughout in different guises uh, today. So that, that's my final remark. Okay, lovely. Um, so we have some time to take some questions from the audience now. Yeah, there's one in the middle there. So how and why should insurance firms provide young aspiring school leavers with greater chances and support of employment? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Okay. It's a bit echoey, isn't it? How and why should insurance firms provide young aspiring school leavers with greater chances and support of employment? Okay, so to, to start answering that question, I think a part of it is in showcasing the, the type of careers that are available. Um, the careers, I think I was talking about it before, um, the insurance industry, in my view, has a lot to offer in terms of job roles. Um, like I said before, whether you're introvert or extrovert or have a, you're analytical or sales-driven, there, there are different roles um, between underwriting, claims handling, and I think maybe we need to do a bit more in sort of showcasing, showcasing those roles and, and talking about case studies like Zigo, um, other insurance case studies which are a bit exciting or even a little bit sexy, mm -hmm. talking about that and reaching out to the schools. Um, I think there's, there's more of that going on recently. Um, 
I think next, not next month, in March, I'll be reaching out uh, together with other industries to Bayside and Westside Comprehensive School. So we'll be talking about careers, engaging with the careers fair, and just showing, showing the pr potential career paths that there are. And I think you mentioned earlier today that Brett, your president, and you are discussing mentorship schemes coming in at some point, no? Correct, yeah. So the, the current GI, GI president is in the process of developing a, 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 a mentorship scheme, sort of more, more specified for, for the needs of the industry. But that should help as well. Yeah, I, I think the other thing to mention is, is the role that the professionals in the uh, industry and community have in main maintaining inclusivity, because you were talking about inclusivity and the people who leave, and you were talking about diversity. Um, so at Grant Thornton, we're hiring locally, including from the university, but um, the Women in Insurance Network is sponsoring two of our auditors who audit insurance companies, and we're hoping that they will get external development and coaching and then stay in the industry. So that's a community um, initiative which addresses two of the big concerns you were talking about, which only we can sponsor. No, no one else can sponsor that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for um, anything to add to that point? No? No, I think it's no, a, a grand initiative, actually. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if... Um, the audience had heard of um, a charity called the Insurance Museum. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad someone has heard of them. Um, but they're, they're a charity, and they actually use um, really interesting insurance stories, um, and they post this to social media. So all sorts of things like, you know, how, how has Elvis been insured? Um, yeah, uh, didn't Mariah Carey insure her legs or her Mariah voice Carey. for 35 million or something ridiculous? Yeah. Tina Turner. Hmm? Yeah, Tina Turner's legs. legs. No, Mariah Carey, her yeah. voice, 35 million or something yeah. like that, yeah? Yeah. In 2016, she did a tour. Yes. I know this somehow. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. we, we really got, fun way to get oh, young yeah. people involved. Um, are we there got, any more questions? There's one here. Um, yes, I was wondering whether we could go back to the silent pillar Yes. principle, because I, th I think um, Nick's picked on something there that's quite powerful. Insurance is a distress purchase a lot of the time. We buy it because we have to. You know, if it goes well, if we happen to make a claim and we get that sorted out smoothly, we say nothing. If we experience problems with a claim, we tell our friends and family. And therefore, the public perception around insurance it is, is not as good as uh, other areas. I think that probably feeds into the reasons individuals don't think about a career in insurance. So if it's the silent pillar, what are the characteristics that we need to turn it into the exciting pillar? <laughs> um. that, thanks for that. Well, um, who, who asked the question? I can't see. Um, they're at so the can... back there. It's, it's Kevin, Kevin Borrett from Advantage. Thanks, it's just so I can answer it. Um, so it, it's a difficult one. Um, I think we've spoken about it a little bit and I think there's events like this is a perfect example and talking about case studies, but uh, I think you're spot on. Uh, we talk about our negative issues with insurance. Um, in, in Gibraltar, people always say, el, el seguro siempre gana, the insurance always, always wins and it's not necessarily the case. Um, I've, I've worked um, in business before where one specific book of business is not necessarily profitable and we're really just, I guess, providing a service to the, to the community. So I guess it's about showcasing the efforts made in the insurance industry, um, what the Gibraltar University does, what the GIA does, what the Gibraltar Insurance Institute does, because there's a lot of volunteers um, putting a big effort for the industry. And, and talking about the, the case studies, I hope that helps. I don't know whether any charitable cause could be a good rep for the industry for insurance firms to do or the associations to do. Focus on something charitable once a year so that you know you, you, could, you get good press and good rep that way. You know, these things tend to filter through the subconscious, you know, the frontal lobe and back lobe. Yeah. But these, it, it happens. Think, it's, think, more, it's all marketing, isn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah, thinking out loud, uh, perhaps an industry annual open day. Something that I, 
that I saw recently, well, a few months ago, and I quite li liked, was the Gibraltar Regiment recruitment campaign. You walk into the, the John McIntosh shawl and you just see the efforts that they make for their industry, and you almost feel like taking part. So, sort of a bit of a recruitment drive where you get some of the organizations together to, again, showcase case studies and yeah. open up. And good up. stories. Good yeah. stories, yeah. That could work. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Yeah. And we thought it was going to be boring, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Chris Johnson here. Uh, just a point of information as opposed to a question. Um, if you look, if you Google online government, uh, sorry, Gibraltar employment statistics, there is every year a ret an employment return which lists all of, the, all of the employees in Gibraltar and the, um, includes obviously the insurance sector. Um, and I'm not sure whether it's strictly speaking ethnic minorities, but it divides them in terms of nationality between Gibraltarian, other British, Moroccan, Spanish, other EU and other. So out of 29,500, sorry, 30,403 jobs in 2021, uh, I think 772 are other. Um, I won't give you the rest of the numbers. It's all there online if you want to have a look. So, just so you know, it is there. We do collect statistics. Thank you. It's good. Thank you. <laughs> I think the, the there are statistics, but it's hard to divulge what what is the what are the ethnic minorities because we generally have Gibraltarians, British, um, again Spanish, Portuguese, but they're not necessarily ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the question we were discussing before, it, it was more to do with um, earlier, those who retain, who actually go to, to C-suite, to management level, no? That wasn't the retention yeah. angle that I think you were, you were trying to put across. Yeah. That, I think, is a difficult statistic to get. Yeah, I agree. But insurance, um, in general, there are very few um, <coughs> ethnic minorities that... Um, work in senior positions um, at the moment. And um, yeah, I know it's something that the industry is working very hard to solve and uh, they're putting all sorts of things in place, Men mentorship. Um, I know the CII had a few um, initiatives in place as well. Um, any more questions? Because we've, we've got about five minutes. Yeah. So it, it's not a question, it's more information. Um, I, people have been listing professionals in Gibraltar, so I just want to say the word actuary, because I am one, <laughs> and there are more actuaries here. Um, but we do have a very active Gibraltar Actuarial Society, which does a lot of education. And in fact, we have the coolest name of any actuarial society in the world. We're known as Actuaries Rock. So. Uh, <laughs> um, and we do sessions on professionalism and AI, biodiversity, decision making, so to ed educate actuaries and non-actuaries who are in Gibraltar or who are working on Gibraltar companies. So it's an extra, an extra bit of education and it is open to anybody. Plus, as, as a group of actuaries, we're really keen to encourage people to become actuaries. Um, it's a great career. Research has proved it's incredibly well paid and low stress. So what's not <laughs> to like? Um, so if, if anybody anywhere knows anyone who's good at maths, then get in touch with me because we can very easily talk about the actuarial world. And I, th I think if that's helpful to you, I'll ju just mention that. Yeah, Thank really, you. really helpful. Are there, are there many local actuaries? Um, there in. Gibraltar and the Campo, there are probably about 12 to 15. Uh, on my mailing list for Actuaries Rock, I have over 100 people because we have actuaries, actuarial sympathisers, and act actuaries in other jurisdictions who work on Gibraltar companies. So, yeah. we're, we're open to all. How does it compare per capita? The, the actuaries here versus some of the numbers of firms? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I did actually do that calculation because I'm an actuary and it's about the same. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing okay then? Yes, but we have 
50 insurance companies. We've mentioned already that one third of cars in the UK are insured here. There is a big market for actuaries. So maybe per capita, it's about right. But per pound of GWP, it's probably too low. And the actuaries we're employing, although the ones here, we're all busy, that money is going into London, to London-based actuaries, Danish actuaries, Bermudan actuaries, Swiss actuaries, you, you name it. They might as well be here. And I think that would tie in with the minister's aims. Mm -hmm. And um, you, as I always say, you can't be too rich, too thin, or have too many actuaries. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions? We have a couple minutes left. No? Um, okay. In that case, um, could I give, could the audience please give a round of applause to the two speakers? Okay.